Am I audible? Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. Um, yeah, welcome to week 15 of uh, our lesson. Um, this is the second last uh, week of the course and uh, we're almost drawing to an end with the course. Uh, welcome to all our e-learning e students as well. Um, uh, maybe we could start with a word of prayer and uh, probably people would slowly start coming in. Um, uh, Elisha, could I request you to kindly begin with a word of prayer, please? Okay. No, no. Thank you. Our most gracious and everlasting Father, we thank you and we bless you this morning for the gift of life that you've granted us. We bless your holy name, Father. We commit our class this morning into your hands once again as you have always been with us and guided us through this period. Father, this time also do exceedingly above as we expect in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, commit our pastor into your hands. Lord, continue to flow through her, grant her the utterances and grant us also the understanding and the insight of whatever will be taught here. We pray for our colleagues who are here to join us, that Lord, you grant them the grace to join us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisha. appreciate that. All right. Um, so welcome to those who've just uh, come in and good morning. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're at our second last class and we just have uh, uh, two more portions, uh, two more pieces of our portion to complete. Um, and today we'll be looking at uh, one of the last special issues in counseling. We've just kind of picked up a few relevant and most important ones that um, we may commonly face and there may be much more but we've just picked a few up um, especially you know in our regular ministry of people and leading maybe congregations or just being within a community would be helpful to us so today we're going to uh, look into grief and grief counseling and if you'd like to follow with me we will be on page 51 in the textbook uh, but before we get started, I think I just want to, you know, uh, have a couple of thoughts and uh, hearing from um, from some of us over here. Um, to first of all, uh, uh, you know, all of us have probably gone through some form of grief at some time in our lives. Now, grief, uh, the reference to grief is specifically a loss, you know, uh, a loss of something. It needn't be only death. Bereavement is generally what is considered the, the death of a loved one. But uh, when we're saying grief, it's a general loss. So it could, it could be loss of many things, you know. It could be um, maybe the loss of something significant that you've had in your life um, or, or even a loved one. So... Uh, Maybe the the death of a loved one is something that probably, in all probability, all of us have come face to face at some point of time. May not be uh, it may not be a very close personal relationship, or it could be, but we've all experienced um, some form of loss at some time. So, uh, in your experience. You know, when you have been, when you have gone through that period of loss or that period of grief or bereavement, uh, do you remember or can you think about some of the things that people have said to you have been helpful and some of the things that you felt was not helpful or maybe it was even bordering on to being very insensitive about um, 
um, about some of their remarks or comments. So anyone here, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of us have at least heard some people say, oh, you must have overheard somebody telling somebody else who's in bereavement. And uh, you've kind of felt that that may not have been such an appropriate uh, response. So just opening it out, just so that, you know, uh, when we are able to kind of have a base of what we have seen or what we've heard, it helps us in opening up and unlearning maybe some things that uh, we think is maybe normal or, you know, that those are general responses that you can expect. So, yeah, so opening this out and, and it would be nice if a few of you could uh, just unmute and say some things that somebody said was helpful or some things that someone said was unhelpful during a time of loss or bereavement. Opening it up. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I don't know who's speaking. Rupa, Rupa. Good morning. Rupa, friends. yes, Rupa. Good, good morning. morning, good morning. Yeah, go ahead, Rupa. Okay, good morning, friends. This is something which is really burning in my heart from yesterday, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my relatives, she lost her, uh, only last month, they lost their 16 year old daughter to a very bad accident. Uh, road accident she was uh, riding with someone she fell on the highway and the lorry ran over her it was very painful ma'am and uh, i was not uh, able to i was very feeling very sad at the same time not able to make myself make that call to call her her mother mm. uh, but after much prayer, my husband uh, visited them and he said, please give them a call. But mm -hmm. when I called her, she was sharing with me. I said, what do you say? I told her, I have nothing to say. I'm just it's something as you are shocked. I am also shocked. And mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I just called you up to let you know that we are just standing with you. And, but I don't even understand the grief and the pain you're going through. Uh, but I just wanted to call you. Then she poured out her heart saying how insensitive were people saying that you have another daughter, take courage, something like that. And your daughter is in a better place. She's an angel now. All that I understand, but I want my child back. I feel her loss. It's so tormenting. I'm not, I don't know why I am living and breathing. And I have not lost my faith, but there are so many questions when God can protect her. Why this way? Why did my daughter has to pay the brunt for someone else's mistake? Something, so many things going on in her uh, mind and she is really in grief. I told her, you grieve for your daughter because she is part of you. I and it's not uh, wrong in grieving for your daughter. Because nowadays, Christians, they just feel that because they have so many promises. When you lose someone, it's not right to grieve. But I think it's a process. God has given us this gift of tears or grieving will really heal our hearts. But I don't know why the Christian world, that Christian jargon has made it so insensitive people are not able to stand with people in their loss very educated they just uh, go there and start uh, giving them lecturing them how they should take it and why should take it and they should take it that way i think that is not the place where they should preach there's just standing we are also really we don't know so many answers we don't know why. And she's saying, why did I lose my daughter? Maybe I, I have sinned, something like that. I told her, if God takes away our children because of because if we sin, no one will have children now. That I don't think that is the point. I don't understand, but 
it just mm -hmm. i just listened to her and when i heard her uh, cry and lamentation it was really breaking my heart yesterday i just wanted to tell that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. thank you rupa thank you i think you gave such a beautiful gist of what we are going to be looking at in the next 2 hours and i appreciate that um, you have you know in your understanding and the wisdom god has given you you reached out to her uh just standing by her and uh just crying alongside with her i think that's wonderful thank you rupa that was that was good i think chaya has written um in my life repeatedly things were happening and i sorry i can't read this and and those uh things was happening and those movement i was in a very um, bad mental state but i was with god's word and faith in god i was not ready to take a doctor's advice i just remain in my faith in god those days i went to apc counseling center it was encouraging and as i i was able to be still in the lord and today i'm here stronger and this course is really very helpful okay lovely thank you chaya for sharing that thank you yeah yes so anybody else would like to bring about uh, any other thoughts about what you've heard as helpful and what you feel is unhelpful to say to those who are grieving come on i'd like some involvement i'm sure there are things people have said or you've heard people saying so that's all that we're asking to share over here so that we can connect to what we are also learning go ahead i think somebody unmuted yes um yes i maybe i'll just share one of the uh, sure customer sure. go ahead to be one sir to mm -hmm. near me yes i can yes yeah okay so um uh i think about um uh, maybe or 12 12 to 13 years ago my i lost my brother uh, he was a cancer patient uh, and um he was uh, progressively getting sick got better at one time and then he uh, relapsed and got the he got he got cancer again and he passed away and uh, at that time i was um, i was living in singapore and we used to have a um, a group of friends maybe around um, maybe about 15 20, 15 20 couples you know with family and um, I still remember that um, when when they heard about it, uh, they all wanted to descend uh, and come and visit me as a group, come to my house. I'm not saying that it was you know, going to be uh, you know 30 people, but it could have been maybe you know 20, 15, 20 people. And um, my my initial response, or uh, because of how I'm I'm sort of made up. uh was that i wanted to grieve uh, in a more uh, uh solitary way so i i told them no i i don't i, I don't want them to come over and uh, they came they communicated um, individually uh so i i guess the point i was trying, i'm trying to make is that there are times when we want to reach out to people who are you know particular times uh, you know times of grief and uh, we feel that it's it would be good to you know go, go as a group or go as not go, not to us uh, individually because sometimes it's quite difficult to to reach out to people and uh, but it doesn't always work that way and it is not it is not always uh, you know um, accepted by by the person who's grieving so uh, just just wanted to make that point here mm thank you 
Yes, thank you, Christopher. So I, I think something that uh, Christopher was highlighting is uh, grieving is a very, very individual experience. Not all people grieve the same way, take the si same time, uh, use the same techniques, but uh, it's all it's all individual related. And the more we can understand that um, how it presents itself can be very different from one another. We're also more mindful about how much, uh, what is, how much, what we offer and how we offer it. So thank you, Christopher, for sharing that. Uh, I think Samuel said, just sharing the silence is best, uh, being in the vicinity, just being there. Okay. And uh, he says, I feel myself lost for words. Okay. Right. So I, I think we've somehow got an essence of, um, of what is helpful, what isn't helpful. And I'm hoping that as we go through the lesson, there will be more things that we pick up and understand and um, be careful in the way that we respond. So I think um, the first and foremost underlying understanding we need to have is when someone is going through grief, um, there is a tendency for, for outsiders, for people outside of the, the core group, like maybe it's a friend of yours or someone who is, who's close to you, has gone, has had a loss. The fear of what to say, the fear of how am I going to come in as comfort? And because of that fear, a lot of people avoid actually making that call or visiting or attending a funeral because of the discomfort that, that one feels within themselves of how am I going to face somebody. But I think through stories that have, and this is more, more than it is academic, these are stories or these are what people have really said is that when somebody close passes away, they're actually looking for people to see who's taken the time and the effort and moved out of that comfort to reach out. Maybe not in any grand, helpful way, but just to express support and oneness at that time. So I had a friend who lost his father and um, he even remembers when as we as he talks about that was a sudden death and when he talks about how many of his close friends were there for the funeral or were there to visit him or pay their respects to his father and that's something he still remembers so what we need to understand is when someone is going through grief to know that the discomfort I may be feeling as an individual uh, is something that I take control to manage. But just being able to go there in presence, in physical presence, or maybe a phone call, if you're not able to you know, physically meet someone because they're somewhere else far away, that in itself brings about a sense of uh, that, that they're not isolated, they're not alone, that, they, that there's a sense of loss, but they feel the connection. So that's something that, uh, you know, if you don't pick up anything else, but if you understand this, that uh, moving away from your own discomfort, knowing that your level of discomfort is very small compared to the pain and the struggle that they may be going through. And if you are able to step in to show them your... Um, your presence there, it is, it's far more, it, it, be, it has that process of uh, healing and process of being uh, not abandoned and isolated at the time of need. Okay. All right. So um, let's, I'm just going to just, I'll just present my screen.
Sorry, just give me a moment. Okay. All right. So we we'll take um, we'll just go through uh, some of this. Uh, um, you know, maybe some of these things are quite. Uh, uh, it's not new, but nevertheless, I think it'll be helpful if we can just uh, look through some of this. So as as we were looking at what is grief, grief is uh, uh, it is a it's a normal, and it is an expected. It is a natural response to any form of loss. It is something that is, um, is please you look at the words. It's natural, it's normal, it's expected. It, it is an expected reaction to any form of loss. And bereavement is a type of grief that involves the death of a loved one. So what, what takes place in grief is the kind of suffering that one feels when something that has been very important and close to them has been taken away. And this is, um, uh, and whatever the kind of loss may be. Now, when we're looking at grief, it can be loss of a, a pet, a loss of a job, loss of a, uh, you know, a relationship, a loss of, of some kind of a material um, asset or, or whatever. So that it can be in different ways right or even the loss of health the, just the fact that someone understands that they are having a terminal illness and the grief that um that they experience through that so remember we're looking at grief in general and not just a bereavement but um maybe the focus as we talk about it the examples will probably be more when we're looking at bereavement so it is as we said it's a normal reaction to uh, to the death or to the loss of something uh, when we're looking at bereavement, we're also uh, trying to see, uh, you know, as a counselor, what is it, uh, you know, the, what, what kind of coping um, needs to take, take place? So, so what, uh, the, this, there was a psychologist by name, uh, Warden, who divided the bereavement process specifically into four tasks okay uh, and this is not a linear one uh, you know it is uh, it, it's just it's, it's just placed um, as tasks what should take place when someone is grieving the loss of someone of, of a loved one so the first is in time as an outcome is to accept the reality of the loss now this does not mean and and as we go in through the slides you will you will see um another process of grieving and then uh, things will be a little bit more clear clearer but it is to ultimately accept that there has been a loss the reality coming into terms with that loss while working through that pain of grief that it is a process grieving is a process it cannot be shortened it need it cannot be hurried it cannot be controlled um it's not something that can that can be finished off as quickly as possible. Okay, so working through that process of, of grief, and through that process of grief, helping the survivors adjust to life without the person who has passed away, and also to form some form of a connection. Now. Uh, now, even as I say this, okay, it's not occultic. Okay, what I mean by is either through memories, or through, or through forms of, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe through, um, yeah, more more through memories and and through uh, when when one thinks of them, especially at important dates or important times, maybe their birthdays or anniversaries or some special moments to be able to maintain that connection uh, even as they continue moving on with life. So when we look at bereavement, these are what we're looking as the four tasks. So uh, helping them go through the process of that grief 
to be able to adjust to life without the person, to be able to accept the reality, and as well as to be able to move on while still having those memories and and uh, thoughts about the about the individual. Okay. Now, when we're looking at grief, we understand that grief uh, affects people differently. And the way a person grieves is generally based on the relationship the person has had with the one who they have lost. Okay, so your grief is is more intense when the pro proximity, the intimacy is at a greater level, but a lot more uh, uh, shorter or um, less less lived, uh, short lived when it comes to someone who is at a who may be outside of your circle, your inner circle. Um, we we also see that the way that people grieve is different. So the the person who's grieving, it's an individual experience, and how they deal with the loss could also be very different as well. So even as we are going through the next few lessons of, uh, I mean, next few slides, um, now this is this is what we're saying. This is a general understanding, but it is nothing. It is not that people should follow a certain pattern of grieving. But we do understand that grieving can be a very personal experience and can be felt differently by by uh, people. And it it is also based on the kind of relationship that one has shared with that uh, with one who was lost. Okay. Um, we will just look at certain what are certain signs and symptoms that we may notice and observe when someone is going through grief. So the initial reactions could be one, could be very strange uh, feelings of shock and numbness um, and, if, and just the inability to emote. Um, and uh, so, so when, we, when we look a little bit more in detail, I'll explain this a little bit more. Uh, why does shock and numbness actually happen, you know? Uh, does it mean that um, you know they are they're in a, they're in a state of uh, uh, complete denial? So we we will look at that. There could also be thoughts of disbelief, of confusion, um, of a sense that it is not a reality. This is not real. Real. I'm still in a dream. What if I am in a in a part of a dream? What if all of this, when I wake up tomorrow, all of this is gone? Okay, uh, the mind not being able to grapple with the reality of what has happened. Now, these are certain signs and symptoms of grief and absolutely normal. Okay? Questions of why. The, um, why did such a thing happen? Um, you know, the questions are towards probably uh, God himself. The questions are towards one's ability to not have protected the person, to not have um, diagnosed an issue earlier, to should have done something earlier. So the, the questions could be completely varied there again. Okay, There can be feelings of sadness, of anger, of guilt, of loneliness. There can be mixed emotions, fear, nervousness, a lack of confidence. It could and there can be significant fluctuations of what is of what's going on. Okay, and uh, maybe there are a couple of days that uh, the person feels a lot better, but maybe when it nears an important day or an important memory, there can be these kind of fluctuating moods that you, that one would see. There's also there could be blaming that happens, where. Um, that that someone else was the cause of this, and if this didn't, if that didn't happen, um, the you know the person wouldn't have passed away, or they could have um, you know a sense of feeling that they have the same problem as the one who died. You know, maybe if it is a sense of an illness, a uh, long-term illness, somebody's gone through experiencing the same kind of pain or pressure or uh, uh, debilities that. Um, the person had, the diseased person had, they kind of sense that. Or, and also, 
uh, an inability to function normally, no fee, no, not able to concentrate, paying attention, having issues with sleep, having significant um, physiological symptoms of anxiety and uh, agitation and restlessness, an inability to um, structure thoughts, organize emotions, all of that are very common symptoms of grief and bereavement. Okay. Now, I'd like to uh, uh, bring about, uh, and, and this is something that is very, um, you know, especially in, uh, in the world of, world of psychological science, this is uh, a way to understand grief. And this was brought about by a Swiss psychiatrist, and uh, her name was Kubler-Ross. And she introduced this five-stage grief model in one of her books called On Death and Dying. And at the time that she bought about this uh, model, a lot of people opposed this because they believed uh, that you know what she was explaining had a specific order in which people would grieve and that all people should go through all the stages. But um, uh, she did state that these stages are not linear. That is, they don't go one after the other. And or some people may not experience at all, yet others might undergo one or two stages rather than all five um, or all three stages. So it is now it's readily known that these five stages of grief are often the most commonly observed uh, in a grieving population. She, she, she spoke about these five stages and it is often known as DABDA, which means uh, Initially, at the time of the loss, it is a state of denial. Then comes a state of anger. Then bargaining, a state of depression. And it plateaus on into acceptance. So we'll just look quickly at each of these stages and uh, just kind of explain what happens in the, each of these stages for us to identify where someone would be at okay so the first stage is denial now it is the stage that uh, that initially helps the person to survive the loss um, they may begin to feel that life makes no sense life has no meaning or even sense that life is too overwhelming um, there can be times that they deny the news and go into a place of numbness so it's it's also common that uh, you know in this stage to really wonder how life will go on um, in the different state you know because the person may be in a state of shock because life as they once knew it has suddenly changed in moments um, like for example if one is diagnosed with a disease they might believe that the news is incorrect and or or you know something uh, an error has occurred. Um, uh, somewhere maybe in the lab and you know they, they mix up uh, blood work with somebody else or if the news of a love, death of a loved one comes about perhaps they cling to the hope that they identified the wrong person okay and, um, or in the denial stage what happens is the person the the survivor is not living in the actual reality rather they're living in a preferable reality okay what if it was it was this way uh, so why is the denial and shock it, you know it is a way to help you cope and survive the grief event what does denial do it aids in pacing the feelings that one has of grief so instead of being very overwhelmed with the grief um, what happens is that is a process of denying it and not accepting it. And so what happens is, is the effect of it gets staggered and it, uh, it, th that full, full impact gets staggered over time uh, and it comes on one at a time. So it is almost like the body's natural defense system that, that is crying out and saying, you know, this is as, as best as I can take. So once the denial and the shock uh, starts to fade, the, then comes, the, that's where the healing process begins. At this point, all those feelings um, that were suppressed begins to surface. And that's why a lot of times you would see people, you know, who 
who come with certain news are not able to emote at all. They, they feel absolutely numb. They're not able to cry because they are in a place of denial. But then when that phase, and it is important for them to go through that phase, because as I said, for the body or for the mind to take out, take up such a stress can be hard. So it gets staggered in time. The second phase is that of anger. So once the individual starts living in the actual reality again, and not in the, in the preferred reality, um, what kicks in? first could be anger. Now, this is a common stage to think, uh, where people think of why me, or you know, life is just so unjust. They may look to blame others for the cause of their grief, or they may redirect their anger to friends and family. Um, uh, or, or you know, they may just uh, are not able to grapple with the truth of what has actually happened. So people who have strong faith begin to question their belief in God. This is that place of, of anger. You know, where is God? Why didn't, like Rupa was saying, why didn't God protect her? Now, research sh agrees that this anger is a necessary stage of grief. And it is important to encourage the anger. When I mean by encourage the anger is to help them let it out. It's important for them to feel the anger. Uh, it's even thought that even though, um, you know, you might seem like uh, this, that, that, uh, that a person is in this, in this complete uh, stage of anger, it will at some time dissipate. And in fact, it says the more that you feel the anger, the quick, the more quickly it will dissipate, the more quickly one will begin to heal. It is not healthy to suppress those feelings of anger because it is a natural response. And to experience a grief event, you, know, you might feel a disconnection with what it is, that there is, there is nothing to keep you as your foundation. Because everything has shattered. Everything that was held on to has suddenly diminished. So anger becomes like the strength to bind one back to the actual reality. It becomes like the glue to bind one back to the reality of the situation. There may be feelings of desertion. There may be feelings of, of abandonment during these events, events that nobody is there that you're finally standing alone. And uh, the direction of anger towards something or somebody is what often bridges one back to the reality and begins to help them connect to people again. So it's something to grasp, and it is a natural step in healing. So that's the second part of a um, second process of it. The third one is bargaining. Now, what's bargaining? That when something bad happens, you know, we know that we often make a deal, right? You're making a deal with God, or you're making a deal in your, you know, if, if I get this back, I promise from tomorrow onwards, this is what I will do, right? Like, if you would heal my loved one, then I will definitely, um, you know, do this much better. I will be, I will be a better person. I, I will love them. So this is bargaining in bargaining. And this stage in some way is called false hope because you what what the person is doing is falsely making oneself believe that you can avoid the grief through a negotiation if you like you know if you change this then i will i will do this in turn so it is it's a sense of desperation that one has to get back their life before this kind of a um a grievous event and the willingness to make that major life change uh, is, is like an attempt towards bringing back things to normal. Now, guilt often is another uh, important factor of or important emotion that comes by during bargaining. This is when they begin to endure those statements of those what if statements. What if I had left 
um, you know, gone there earlier? What if I had driven the car? Um, what if I had asked him, uh, to, you know, to meet with the doctor a few months ago? Um, what if I had said this before I left? So they, they, these are all ways of looking at, you know, a, a sense of negotiation and a sense of bargaining that happens. The next stage is um, the stage of depression. Now, depression is commonly, it is an accepted form of grief, whereas the other shock or denial or bargaining is almost seen to be pathological or seems to be abnormal, but it is a normal process. Okay. In fact, most people associate depression immediately with grief as it is a emotion that seems most connected. It, what does it represent? It represents the emptiness one feels that uh, they are living in a reality and realize that the person or the situation has gone, uh, is no more there. It is this stage that they might begin to keep away from others, you know, withdraw, um, maybe live in, um, uh, you know, within themselves, not really wanting to meet and uh, bridge with others. Um, everything on the outside looks very overwhelming to face. It can look like uh, nothing makes meaning. Uh, you may not, people don't want to be with others. They don't like talking, experience feelings of hopelessness, um, even probably having certain suicidal thoughts, death wishes, thinking about what's the point of going on. So that's, that's the phase of depression. The last stage of grief, which was identified by Kubler-Ross is acceptance. And this acceptance not in the sense is not in the sense, okay, it's okay that the person died, rather an acceptance that the person has died and I can move on or I will be okay. So here in this stage is when emotions begin to stabilize and there is a re-entrance into reality. You come into terms with the fact that the new reality is what you're going to have to face um, or that you know the reality can be that you know the person is no more with you or that there is an illness and um, you know what is going to happen and uh, you're and you're okay with with all of that so it's it you, you don't classify it as a good thing but you you're but the but uh, this process is helping one to know that it's something that they need to live with it's a time of a lot of adjustment that the person may have. So even as they go through this phase, it doesn't mean that they're not going to have bad days. Okay. And it does not mean that they will never feel sad again or that they may not tear up or cry or feel that uncontrollable, uncontrollable sadness. But the better days will outnumber those sad days or those bad days. And it is at this stage that um, you begin to start engaging with people, doing the doing tasks and things, and making new relationships, um, understanding, you know, and even coming to a place of understanding that um, the loved, the loss, the one who who is deceased or who passed away, can never be replaced. But you choose to move and uh, start involving your oneself into their new reality. So these are generally the stages that she has described. Like I said, it is not linear that one goes into another. Sometimes there can be a skip. Sometimes one may go back to, you know, come back from an acceptance, may come back to a bargaining and then again. But it is it is a, like, like a web and flow, uh, ebb and flow. It is a it is a process in itself. Um, so generally, you know, I think how is it that you can identify is you will hear certain remarks such as this. And at a denial phase, there is this, the, the common comment is this can't be happening to me. This is unreal. This is, I'm, I'm in a dream. The place of anger is why is this happening? Who is to blame? The place of bargaining is make, make this not happen and in return I will do something. There's a negotiation uh, there. And depression is I'm too sad to do anything and acceptance is 
I am at peace with what has happened. Okay. All right. I'll just uh, briefly uh, pause here for any specific uh, questions before we move on. On what, how can we minister? What can we do? Any questions? Yes, Samuel, go ahead. Um, can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, I can. I can. All right. Um, so, so I understand, uh, you know, how a person may go through these stages, and uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking at, I mean, if I am somehow um, responsible for counselling a person mm -hmm. who is. Uh, undergoing grief and I, I, I recognize these stages whether it's denial or anger and I, I understand uh, that you know this is normal natural even healthy for the person to process grief but uh, I think often what we see is uh, if this person has other dependencies like you know maybe maybe the husband died the mother is grieving is in denial or anger but they are uh, young kids and uh, you know while it's important for the mother to undergo these stages I can see that it's not uh, having the right kind of effect on the kid like the moms to like the moms taking too long to reach <coughs> acceptance and hope because of which the children are getting neglected or you know the children maybe the mom is angry at the kids for some reason uh, for the loss of the father or, or something where you know um, while it's important for the person to undergo it. so so a is I, I don't know if we should rush the person to the stage of acceptance or hope is that is that even doable uh, is that is is that what I'm supposed to do or uh, you know, uh, yeah. So, so, so that you know, I, I think ba basically, I'm looking at the person. Well, so, while I understand the person who is undergoing these stages, but I'm thinking of the dependencies that these people have. And normally, it's uh, a children. single parent. Yeah, children. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, we we do not rush grief. We do not hurry it. We give them the pace to uh, experience the entire process because if that is if it is prematurely stunted then there can be significant um, issues in that process of healing which will definitely have long term impact on the dependencies further from there but sometimes it is a challenge when uh, especially when the dependents are younger children and the need is a lot more their understanding is limited um, um, uh, so much so uh, it can become insensitive and uh, um, so I, I think I could I could uh, I could tell you of what fallout that what fallout happens is generally the 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 bereaved tends to suppress these emotions especially like you said you know when there is a single parent there's a lot of expectation now when you're looking at it i'm not looking at it psychologically i'm looking at it socially to step up to be this the stronger parent to be the strength of the dependencies and you know get the act together and get going there becomes an expectation and quite often than not we find that that those single parents begin to, uh, they do not have a choice, but they assume, they begin to assume that role. Okay. And you will tend to see the fallout of that years later, where there's a short temper, there's a sense of anxiety, there's a sense of unfinished business. Um, there's, there's a lot of anger that builds up towards society, towards the diseased um, so that could be 
some things that we see that that may happen now in situations like this i know it may not be very easy to smooth in every corner to ensure that the mother gets the support or mother in this case if if so gets the emotional support the children are understanding or get their needs or whatever it may not be possible to do that but the best that one can figure out and this is something um i mean this is a live example of uh uh um, someone we knew they they had a quite a large family and at the birth of the ninth child was when the mother passed away during the delivery is when the mother passed away and this father had to look after these eight children but that's when the whole church community stepped in and started taking practical charge of things around the house so and all these children were being homeschooled by the mother so there were uh, you know the, the church stepped up started building a roster for things for child care for home care for whatever was required for a good uh, i think almost for a good 4 months uh, post that to help the 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 father the husband grieve uh, and to also go back to his normal process of work and things like that so yes it takes a community sometimes uh and sensitive community to be able to help deal with this um to expect that a mother or you know maybe even a counselor could do the job on their own i think that that is that is um uh that's a misnomer and that's why you enlist support of those around especially at the time when someone is grieving so yes you're right that there can be huge concerns or and the impact could be great but i mean i've seen a live example of how people have stepped in and uh, helped the the parent to work through the initial few months of uh, of loss yeah i hope i answered that samuel yes yes but um what i'm hearing i think uh, is um that instead of focusing on the parent to kind of go through the st- stages and and in that effort even somehow rushing them we let the parent go through the process of grief naturally and rather focus on the dependencies and try and see how they can be supported so the the, sh- the, the shift the, there's a shift in focus okay absolutely yeah yeah okay yeah. great okay we'll uh, stop for a 10 minute break i it's 10:53 on my clock we will be back at 11:03 <laughs> 